No problem. Okay, today's daf is Masech the Baba Kama, daf Kuf Yud Beis, 112. And we are beginning on daf Kuf Yud Beis, I'm at Aleph. It's about one third of the way down, Tana Rabbana. Okay, here we go, we'll make it bigger. Hide the controls. Okay, Tana Rabbana, the rabbi is taught. And this is the name of the parak. Hagoizil, someone steals. Let's say someone stole an animal, right? And what did he do? He gave it to his kids to eat for supper. Umachel as bonav. Okay, one second. Hi, we just began, and we're on Daf Kuf Yud Beis Amar Aleph, one third of the line, one third of the way down. So here we go. Taner the rabbis taught Hagoizel, Hagoizel Umachel as bonav. Someone who who stole, let's say, an animal. And gave it to, fed his kids with it, right? So now he gave it to them for supper. So now the kids, when they grow older, put, and their father was this great Ganav, maturing Lasham, they're not obligated, they're not liable to pay back the, the, the Geneva that their father stole and gave them to eat because they didn't do the stealing. But what happens? Heniach Lifnehem, let's say the father died and left the animal that he stole for them as a Yerusha, as an inheritance. What are they supposed to do with it? So good if they're older children, chayovim l'shalem, they have to, chayovim l'shalem. If they're older kids, they have to pay the animal back to its owner. Okay? So if their father died, the father stole an animal and 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 left them as an inherit and then died, left them as an inheritance, an animal. So the older children, if there's older children inheriting this this animal, they have to pay it back to the to the person that the father stole from. Kitanim, but if they're younger children, let's say there's everybody who's inheriting this animal is under bar mitzvah, then peturim l'shalem. They're not ob obligated to pay. Why? Because you can't bring a a um, a cotton to court. Right? He's under bar mitzvah. And even though the animal is still around and everybody, it was a stolen animal, still you have to, the, the, the nigzal, the one that was stolen from, has to come collect it. And that is a judicial process and you can't take a, a cotton to court. And, uh, and this b'risa goes according to Sumchus, who says, katanim don't have to pay back. Vim amru gedoylim, let's say, you said before that gedoylim are chayovim to pay back, right? If they're older by mitzvah kids, they have to pay the animal back to the nigzal. But let's say they tell the nigzal, Ain on we don't know We don't know any calculations that our father made with you. In other words, we don't know. Maybe our father paid you money. How do I know? You know, I yes, this animal is yours, but maybe my father wrote you a check and paid for this animal. So then Peturim, they're not obligated to pay. So so they the 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 the, the inheritors say, perhaps my father wrote you a check. The Gazan says, the Nigzal says, the guy that got it stolen from says, I never got back anything from your father. So why do we believe the inheritors? So that's the Gemara's question. Just because the inheritors say, we don't know, maybe our father wrote you a check and paid for the animal. They're not sure, but the Nigzal is sure that his animal was stolen and he's, he's claiming that I never got paid. And I never got my animal back. And there's my animal in your in your possessions. So why are the if why if the gedolim say maybe, perhaps our father paid you back? They're not obligated to pay. Amarava, so Rava said, Hachi Kamar. This is what the Brisa means to say. Gedolim Sha'amru. If gedolim say Yoidim Onu Cheshbayne Shechishev Avini Imcha, we know for a fact that our father uh, made a side contract with you, a side deal with you. And therefore, he paid for this, even though it's un unusual, because really, if the if the gazela is around, the father would have had to have returned the animal back to the nigzal. But the gedolim, the inheritors, say, we know for a fact that our father, we looked in his uh, uh, bank book, and we see he wrote a check to you, so apparently he paid for the animal. Like, pash leich gabach midi, and there's nothing that we owe you. If, they, if they're sure about it, peturim, then they're the yarshim apotev to pay. Another brisa. Tanya idach. We learned in another brisa. Hagoizel ubachol ubanov. Again, if someone steals and gives it to feed to his kids for supper, peturim l'shalim. 
they're not obligated to pay because they're kids and therefore they didn't they didn't do the stealing and it, of course we're talking about there's yush over here that means the guy that it was stolen from gave up hope and 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 nevertheless they're not obligated to pay even though there's no shina rishus oh here is a different story let's say the father the father um died and left the animal as an inheritance okay and then the kids ate it okay ben the kids ate it so now the brisa says ben gedolim ben ketanim whether the the kids are gedolim or whether they're under bar mitzvah chayovim they have to pay so even though they when they got this inheritance they didn't know that it was stolen property and so we say that the ketanim are obligated to pay so the Gemara asks the question, Kitana mi mechaivi? Are we going to obligate Kitanim to pay money? I mean, how could you, uh, uh, once a cotton does something or steals something, he doesn't have to pay. He's under bar mitzvah. Lo yehe elo de azik azuke. Consider it as if they just damaged the animal. When a, when a cotton damages, we learned this before in the Mishnayis, that if a cotton damages and causes a wound to somebody else, um, he's potted to pay. Because they're ketanim. So therefore, also over here, since they ate it, who's going to force these ketanim to, to pay, to take a job as a waiter? The ketanim, they don't have to pay. So what does the Bryce say? Ben gedolim, ben ketanim chayavim. Amr HaPapa, HaPapa explains, hochi kamar, this is what it's meant to say. Hiniach lefneyam, if it was left before them, this animal that was stolen by their father, ba'adayin loy achulam, and they still did not eat it. In other words, uh, the, the animal is still present. Oh, it's whether they're older children or whether the ketanim, they're obligated to pay. And this is very different than the Bryce before. Here we're saying that if the animal is still in existence, the ketanim have to give it back. Before we said that when the, ketanim, when the animal is in existence, are they potted from paying it back? Now, what's that all about? There's a machloikis between Sumchus and the Rabbanan. Whether if the animal is still in existence and the inheritors are ketanim, do they have to give it back? Rabbanan say yes. And Sumchus says no. Even if the animal is still here, and we know it's a, it's a stolen animal, they don't have to give it back because they're ketanim. The Gemara continues. Oma Rava. Rava said, Hiniach lefneim ahem aviem para shu'ula. If a father left for his kids, he borrowed an ox, he borrowed a cow. Let's say he borrowed a cow for 30 days and only got to use it for 10 days and then he died. Now, as a borrower, the, the you take on all mishaps that can happen with this animal, right? Even if it's not your fault, right? If, if, if somehow the animal dies suddenly, gets a heart attack, whatever, you're obligated to pay. When you borrow something, especially an animal, you're taking on all responsibility so the father borrowed the animal and then uh, the, the father borrowed the animal and then used it only for 10 days and then died so what's the kids do the kids have to return the animal so the gemara says the, the, the kids can use the animal um throughout the the time of the borrow right and therefore, they can use it, no problem. Even though their father borrowed it, they can. They don't have to return it. They can continue to use it. But unlike the father, the kids have a lineage. So if the animal suddenly dies, they're not obligated to pay in any mishaps that happen to the animal. Why? Because they're not, they're not the ones that borrowed it. And they didn't accept upon themselves to watch this animal. As Rashi explains, like Kabilu alai niturusa. They didn't accept upon themselves they're going to watch the animal. So they, they get the benefit of using the animal, but they don't get the benefit, they, they get the leniency that if something happens, uh, they're not obligated to pay any mishaps. Now the Bryce the Bryce continues, Rava continues. Kisuvurim shell of he. What happens? They get, they got this borrowed animal. They thought that the animal belonged to the, their fathers. And let's say during the Shiva, whatever it was, Utvahu. They shechted the, this cow, va'achalu, and they ate it. So really, this is an oinus, but still, they're benefiting from it. They actually destroyed the animal. So the, the, the rabbi said, mishalmin the may basabazol. They pay the cheap 
meat. In other words, they don't get a, get away without paying anything, even though this is a total mis mistake. But they don't have to pay the most expensive meat. They don't have to go to the fanciest butcher store and return meat. They can go to the 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 discount stores and pay uh, meat that's maybe have been worth two thirds of what they took. It's two thirds less um, in price because we don't fault them because they actually thought that the animal belonged to their fathers. Says the Gemara that now Rava said a statement. We don't know what Rava is talking about. Let's say the father left over. Achrayis nechasim is another name for real estate. The father left in his inheritance real estate. Chayavim l'sham. They're obligated to pay. Now, what are we talking about over here? Some said that Rava is referring to the beginning, that when they used the, the, the borrowed cow and the borrowed cow died, so if there's real estate, so we said, they're not, they're not liable if a mishap happens, but if the father left over some real estate, they're obligated to pay. And some say it's only when the kids damaged the animal. If the kids thought it was their father's and they shechted and ate it, they will have to pay back. Uh, if there's real estate, then they have to pay a full amount to the to the to the person that their father borrowed the cow from. So what's the what's this all about? So man, when a person borrows something, that's the question. When a person borrows something, he takes on the responsibility to pay for any mishaps. But when does that obligation begin? It begins when, one would think, it begins when you borrow the animal. That's that's could be. Or we're going to learn an opinion of Rav Papa that says no. That obligation begins when the mishap happens. Then that obligation to pay for the mishap. It's not when you borrow the animal that you're going to someday pay for a mishap. The obligation only begins after the mishap happens. So that will explain why some say this statement of Rava is going on the beginning or is going on the last part, latter part of what Rava's statement is. Man, the Masnal Reisha, the one that said it goes on the beginning of what Rava said, of Besa in Chayovin, uh, because, but if there's real estate, you have to pay it back. It's because the father borrowed the cow. And at that point, the father took on any obligation of mishaps, of oinus. And therefore, if the father left over real estate in his in his inheritance, then when the, if the animal died, even after the father died, you're not, they're, they're obligated to use real estate to pay the owner of the animal. And Kolshkein, I'll say, and certainly if the kids damaged and, and slaughtered the animal, certainly, certainly the real estate has to pay back the owner of the cow. And they're arguing against Rapapa, which we're going to see. Rapapa says the obligation of a borrower to pay mishaps only begins when the mishap actually occurred. But some say that that statement of real estate has to pay the owner of the cow was only if the kids thought that it was their father's cow and they slaughtered the animal and ate it, then if there's real estate, they have to pay back because they're, they're damaging, the, they're the ones that damage the animal. Aval Aresha, but in the beginning, if the animal suddenly died and nobody did anything to the animal, if the animal suddenly died, then the kids are not responsible for any mishaps, even if the father left over real estate behind the Rav Papa, and it's exactly what Rav Papa said. So let's see what this Rav Papa is said. Dom Rav Papa, Rav Papa made a comment. He said like this, if a para was stolen, let's say he stole it on Thursday. Okay, so at that time, at that moment, he's obligated to pay the principal. Then he slaughtered on Shabbos. Normally you say, when you slaughter something on Shabbos, and and you and 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 there's an obligation to pay, so you say you're going to get the death penalty, so you're you're exempt from paying. Here, chayov, you're obligated to pay because the tvicha and mechira that obligates you to pay four and five is x is a knas. The four, the extra four that you're paying, or the extra three that you're paying, is a knas, is a penalty, which even if a person is getting killed. Is 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 chayav benafshe because he's bechal shabbos. He still have to pay the knas, and the principal he had to pay from before because it occurred when he stole it. 
So that's what he said. Since he was obligated on the Geneva before the Shabbos came, so he was chayev to pay the principal on Thursday. And so what, what occurred on Shabbos was that he slaughtered the animal. Now he has to give three more or four more. So that three or four more is a knas. And therefore, just because we're going to put him to death because he slaughtered on Shabbos, that will not exempt him from paying the knas, the, the, the penalty. But this is the point. Let's say he borrowed a cow on Thursday. And he slaughtered it on Shabbos. So he actually slaughtered the animal on Shabbos. He borrowed it. So he's not really a ganav. And, and, and he slaughtered it on Shabbos. So then, obviously, this is a mishap that he has to pay. Potter, then he's potter for paying back the, the, the cow. Because at the same time that he, he did something wrong on Shabbos, at that moment, he's stealing. At that moment, he's making an oinus on the cow, a mishap on the cow that he borrowed. And therefore, it came at the same time. It's it's a din mominous. It's a din, it's a, has a, a monetary uh, obligation. And therefore, that monetary obligation will be exempted because we're going to be putting him to death. So we see that when does the uh, monetary obligation begin when you borrow a cow? Only after the mishap happens. Here, the mishap happened on Shabbos. That's when the monetary obligation began. And therefore, therefore, it came at the same time when you mechal Shabbos, when the person was mechal Shabbos. Because if you tell me the monetary obligation for mishaps begins earlier when you borrow it, then the monetary obligation for this cow began on Thursday when he borrowed the animal. So we see Rav Papa's opinion is that when a person borrows a cow, the monetary obligation of responsibility for mishaps begins only when the mishap happens, not at the time you borrow the cow. New Gemara, Tanur Rabban, the rabbis taught, Why does it say you have to return this, the item that you stole, the, uh, the, the, the stolen item that you stole? You have to return exactly what you stole. From here we say, If you steal something, an animal, and you gave it to kids, for your kids to eat, they don't have to pay because it's not here. But if it's, if it's exactly here, nothing happened to the animal, even if the animal got older, let's say, but if they was left over as an inheritance for older children or just, just people under Bar Mitzvah, they're obligated to give the animal back. Sumchus disagrees. Gedolim have to give the animal back. Ketanim, small children, they inherited the stolen animal. It's so clear that it was stolen that Peturim, they're not obligated to give back because they're Ketanim. You can't take a cotton to court. And because they're not into the judicial system, they're just exempt from giving this animal, although it's clear that it's a stolen animal that was left over by their father's in, uh, uh, inheritance, by their father, by their father's property. Now the Gemara tells a story. Bar Chumua, the Rabbi Yermia, the Bar Chumua, the son, Rabbi Yermia had a brother-in-law who was under Bar Mitzvah. Okay, so he had this brother-in-law under Bar Mitzvah, and the father-in-law died. Now Rabbi Yermia claimed that the house was a gift that his father-in-law gifted him and said that he's going to gift it to him after he dies. So what happened? This kid came. He closed the door on Rabbi Yirmiya and did not allow Rabbi Yirmiya to enter the house. This young kid, he said, because he said, it's my father's house and it's mine. But Rabbi Yirmiya claimed that I, I have witnesses that your father said I could keep it. Also, So they came to Rabbi Oven for a, a court, for a case. Amaloi, Amar, Shaloyhu Tevea. So Rav Oven said that it, it belongs to the kid. He's claiming that it's, it's his father's house, so the house should belong to him. Amaloi. So Rabbi Yirmi said to Rav Oven, Well, my sin is sadi the achazoki be bechayadavua. Didn't I bring witnesses that I, I um, took possession of this house while their father was alive? So let me bring my witnesses to show that the father gifted it to me. The problem is the other side of the case is somebody under bar mitzvah. So Amalei, so Rav Amun said, it doesn't work. We go to Amad Bey. Do we, do we accept witnesses if there's nobody on the other side, if there's nobody, no litigant on the other side? Why? Because even though there's a cotton there, we, 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 we view the cotton as if he's not even in the court because uh, so he, he can't speak up. 
and he doesn't know laws. So therefore, we won't accept your Edim, and we'll just have to wait it out until the kid turns Bar Mitzvah, and then you will we'll adjourn the case until the kid turns to Bar Mitzvah. So the Gemara says, so Rabbi Yirmiya said, what do you mean? A cotton you can't bring to court? Voktani, we learned in our mission, we just learned that if the father stole an animal and left it over, even if all the kids had died, and even if all the kids who are inheriting their father's property are ketanim, if the animal is there, that animal has to be returned to the nigzal, right? It has to be returned. Apparently, the, uh, the nigzal is going to bring witnesses that this animal belongs to him, and there's nobody on the other side because they're ketanim, but they're nevertheless going to be obligated to return it back, to return it back to... Uh, uh, return it back to the uh, the nigzal. So just because the cotton is in the in the in the court and the other side of the case, who says that the, the that I can't bring witnesses? Volkatani, that's what he says. Big ben Whether the gedolim or katanim, they're obligated to return the 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 stolen item to the nigzal. Amalei. So Ravavan said to Rabbi Yirmiya, true that that is the Tanakama. But Rasumchas holds that if there's Ketanim on the other side, they don't have to return the animal. So we're going to go with Sumchas. Alma, so Rabbi Yirmi said, what do you mean you're going to go with Sumchas? Does the, the world, the entire world fold it up to go according to Sumchas? To take away what a house that really belongs to me? I mean, it's ridiculous. I, I have witnesses that the father, my father-in-law said that this house belongs to me. Who's against me on the other side? This cotton? The story rolled into Rabbi Bo's office. Same same case. Amma, he said, You didn't hear what Rabbi Yosef Bachama said in the name of Rabbi Ashaya. Rabbi Yosef Bachama, Rabbi Ashaya, Rabbi Yosef Bachama said in the name of Rabbi Ashaya, Tinek Shetaka Bavadam. Let's say a young kid, he's a clever man. And he took uh, he took workers, okay. And he took guys, thugs off the street, and then he goes and in the yard of the sech and he goes into his friend's field, a, a, a guy who we who we don't know, and he says shalihi, shalihi, this is my field. So now we, we, you're gonna take a, a a small guy to court. He just this kid just locked himself into somebody else's field and is claiming it's his. So what do you do? You wait till he gets over by mitzvah. So Rabbi Shaya said, you don't wait till he gets older and then you can take him to court. I mean, just because he's a cotton on the other side, we take it, we kick the cotton out, you know, the squatter out of the uh, out of the field. And and if the other side has witnesses, then he you know, of course it's the it's the Chavar's field because he's a muhsak in it. when this cotton gets older, if he has a claim, Yavi Adim, let him bring the Adim, Venir and we'll see. So we see that that we don't take a cotton on the other side serious, you know. So so we don't you know push things off until he gets older. If we see justice can be done not right now, we'll do justice even against a cotton. So that was what that was what Rabbi Bo said. So so Gemara says not true. Me dummy. It's a very different case. Hasam who the makbinimene do like kaima le achazaka da avua. In other words, when in the case that Rabbi Shai brought down, it was just a young kid who just lock squatted in somebody else's field. He has no previous chazaka that he ever belonged in that field. Of course, we'll kick him out. Aval here, the brother-in-law of Rabbi Yirmiya was a cotton. He lived with his father in that house. Rabbi Yirmiya is only claiming that when the father-in-law, his father-in-law said that when I die, you could keep the house. So the cotton has a chazaka. He was he had the chazaka of his father that it, the house belonged to his father. So in that case, we can't. We we have to adjourn the case until the cotton grows older because you cannot bring witnesses when the when the other side is not capable of fighting back. Over here, when there's a chazak of the father, Lloyd, you wouldn't bring. You wouldn't allow this case to go forward. So you'd have to push it off. Let's say one party doesn't show up to the case. We can start start the case and have witnesses say over the story, even if the other side didn't show up to the court. Toi be Rabbi Yechonin, Rabbi Yechonin said, v'chi mekablam edim shloi b'fnei baldin, are we going to allow that to happen? Uh, how could it be? I mean, how could you start a court case when one side didn't show up to the court? So kiblam b'nei Rabbi Yechonin, Rabbi Yechonin explained it. 
that what that what what Rab Shapsai meant was kegoyin shayi hu chayla ay edev chayla ay shayi edim of action leilach medina seam or v'shalchu lay v'lay ba. It's a, there's certain circumstances will start a court even when the other side didn't show up. If one person's sick, or let's say the, the Edim say, I, I can't stay here. I'm, I'm, I have to go back to another country. I, I'm getting out of here. And, or you call the Nitva, right? You call the guy, the litigant, and you say, um, you have to show up to Bezdin. And he doesn't come. So then you could start the case without him. But normally you, we wait, we don't start accepting witnesses if one of the Balidinim are not present. Omar Rabbi Yehuda Meshmuel. We'll start. We'll stop in two minutes. Omar Rabbi Yehuda Meshmuel. Rabbi Yehuda Meshmuel said, "The kablim edim shloy b'fnei baldim." We do accept edim in not in front of the baldin. In other words, if one side didn't show up to the court, we we uh we start the case and we start accepting edim. Omar Mar Ukva Mar Ukva explained, "Lemdi mi parshalei min edu Shmuel." I know what Shmuel meant. You can't really start a court case accepting and start. Uh, uh, accepting testimony when one side didn't show up, but in this case, what Shmuel meant is going the pasachu le bedine that really they wanted to start the court case. The sholchulein they sent to one of the parties, the one baldin. The lay also didn't show up to the court. If they didn't start the the court, they didn't start the case yet. Matzi Amale, then the Nitva can refuse and say, I really don't like this court. I'm not showing up because. Not because I'm mean, I just don't like this court. I want to go to a, a higher court. So wait a second. If that's what the nitva is claiming, ihachi, if that's the case, so what's the difference if they started the case, if they didn't start the case, keep sachalei name, when they start the case, right? Matsu Amalei, he could just stop the whole thing and say, Lebezdin Hagado Azina, I want to go to a higher court. And therefore don't accept any any testimony here. I want to go to a higher court. Um, Ravina, Ravina explained, not always do you have that claim, like Trump is claiming, I need to go to a higher court. It doesn't always work that way. Is Kegoin the Nakat Diskab a Bezdin Hagadol? If you have a if they has a license from the Bezdin Hagadol that this court that they went to is all right, then the guy has no, no claim to say, I want to go to a higher court because the 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 the, the Bezdin Hagadol said, use this court. So therefore, if he doesn't show up, then we start uh, accepting testimony, even though he's not present. Amar uh, Rav, we're going to just say um, the the uh, just one more line. Amar Rav, Rav said, Let's say you have a a a loan document and you want to ratify that loan document, even if the lender is not there, we can you know certify that it's a real document, even if the if the borrower didn't show up. Rabbi Yaitan and Amar, Rabbi Yaitan says, mm-hmm. You don't certify a loan document if the borrower is not present. Usually certification is done in court. You can't certify that document unless the borrower is in that court. Amalei, Rav Sheshis, Rabbi Yosef, Bo, Rabbi Sheshis said to Rabbi Yosef, Azberli, time of time with Rabbi Yaitan. I'm going to explain to you what why Rabbi Yaitan says that the borrower has to show up in court. Amakra, the Pasuk says, In order to make a cow a muad, or an animal a muad, the, the, the owner of the cow has to be present in the court. When you're doing something detrimental to somebody, you have to, he has to be present. Amra Torah, the Torah said, The borrower has to be there at presence because you're doing something against him by certifying a document, a loan document, saying that he owes money. Nevertheless, despite the fact that Rabbi Yechelen seems to have a very good reasoning that you can't certify a document without the borrower showing up, but concludes the Gemara, Amarava Hilchis that Allah is Mekaimen Eshashtar Shaloi Bifnei Baldin. We will uh, certify a a a a a document even if the borrower did not show up. And now the Gemara just continues. You can do it uh, later, but Gemara continues regarding. Um, um, how, how much time do we give for a borrower to pay back and uh, if he doesn't believe the document is is authentic? Okay, very good. Use the Gemara of Oimid uh, Even if the guy who is saying that the tr- that the document is not authentic and they're using it to collect against him. And he's claiming that I didn't show up when they certified and, and, and authenticated. The, the document. So we don't listen to him. You don't have to be there when they certify a document. 
I, I can imagine what a headache it would be. Give me time. Uh, I want to come back and I'm going to prove that this document is 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 false. We give him time. If he comes back, fine. If he doesn't come back, we give him Monday, Thursday, and, and Monday. If he doesn't come back, we give him 90 days to pay. It's a document of ostracism. So basically, the first 30 days, we don't go into his possessions to come collect the money. We don't uh, we don't send the marshals in the first 30 days. Because we say, because he's trying to borrow money to pay back. We don't go during the second 30 days into his assets. The marshals don't enter. Dama. We, we say to ourselves, why didn't he pay? Maybe he couldn't find anybody to lend him money, so he's trying to sell some property. Basrai, during the last 60 to 90 days, we still don't go into his property. He probably has a contract out, somebody's buying something from him, and we say that the purchaser is trying to find money. So, but... So therefore, we wait a minimum of 90 days before we send the marshals in to, to collect it. Loyas, if he doesn't come back, kazina adacha we, we write adachta. It's like an authorization allowing the creditor to collect his due from any property belonging to the debtor. The hani mili, the oma asina, or if he says, I'm coming, avo. Omar, if he says, loyas, I'm not coming, valta kasvinim. Then we right away send in the, uh, send in the marshals. If he didn't said if he didn't give an excuse or he didn't say I'm not coming, it's a if it's a loan document. If it was something that he, he was deposited to, he was watching something for somebody. Lalta kasvin. Then we right away send the marshals in because the pekodin is supposed to be in safekeeping. You're not supposed to use it. We're writing this this authorization on land. We don't allow you to. To foreclose on movable items, because we're afraid that maybe the lender is going to use up the movable items. But let's say the lender comes back and 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 it proves that the document, the don't loan document, was false. And the, in the meantime, the lender was eating up using the the movable items belonging to the to the borrower. Like Mashkach so the borrower will never be able to get back his uh, his 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 stuff. The Islay Mikarkilamava, but if the lender has a property, Kasfinin, then we do write it because if worst came scenario comes that the lend the borrower proved that the whole loan was a was a false document and he wants to collect the the metaltalin that the Malva foreclosed on, and if even if the Malva ate it, he has where to collect from because the Malva has karka. But it's not true. We don't allow any marshals to take any metaltalim. Even if the lender has property. We are concerned. Maybe the lender's lands are going to go down in value. And the metaltal was worth more what he took. When we write a adrachta, we let him know. Behind him, the Mikarv, if he's close by, because he has to know that they're foreclosing. The the marshals are coming in to, uh, to foreclose on his property. If he's far away, light, we don't have to let let, let, let him know. Let's say there's a train that goes back and forth from where he is. And then we leave, give him twelve months until the the train, you know, brings him back. Uh, sometimes, if we know where he is, but we can't get this information to him, then we give him a twelve month period to come here, and before we actually send in the marshals to his property. like the story of Ravina. waited for Maracha twelve months till he arrives back. Until the caravans came back from Bechazoi, when he showed up, then they uh, they wrote that uh, adarta, that authorization allowing the creditor to collect uh, against the properties uh, of Maracha. So the Gemara says, Vloihi, that was a special case. He was strong. 
So then, then until this happens, the following happens. A shliach comes on the Tuesday, and he comes on, on, on Wednesday, and and Thursday he can already start the din. But if, if he, uh, it's only a special case where Marach was a, a, a inish alima, was a strong person, so we, we held off for 12 months from doing this. Okay, stop over here.